Welcome to The Old Man of the Three with J.J. Reddick and Tommy Alter, presented by Cash App and brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 94, Don Staley. This is part two of our coaching series brought to you by Future. Tommy, picture the most successful people in sports and fitness. Look at the person right next to them. What do they all have in common? They all have had a great coach. And Future is a new workout experience that pairs you one-on-one with a fitness coach who will map out your entire workout program. They're super available. Tommy, I know you've connected with your coach as well. I've used my guy a bunch. He's great. He's yeah. on demand. A ton of good advice, ton of creative advice. Uh, it's a really cool product. I, I think what's interesting about this product is is the human touch. You know, There's a lot of fitness apps out there. This one is bringing a human touch where you're interacting with a real human being, with a real performance coach that is going to get you in the best shape of your life. Future, by the way, has over 3,000 five-star reviews in the App Store. You can get the Future app. We want you to go to tryfuture.com, T-R-Y, future.com slash old man. That's tryfuture.com slash old man and sign up for Future right now. Um, this episode with Don Staley is awesome. My big takeaway here, Tommy. It's fire. People, great leaders, great coaches are authentic. Dawn is so authentic. She owns herself. She owns who she is, and her teams and her players are a reflection of that. Like, there's just no bullshit with Dawn. She makes you want to run through a wall, and we don't play for her. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. Uh, we, we, we hit on so much stuff. Uh, her playing career, her coaching career. Uh, people may not even realize this. Uh, you know, we did, of course, but, you know, she was an all, simultaneously an all star in the WNBA while also being the head coach of Temple and building that program and getting them to six NCAA tournaments in eight years. She's just, her story is incredible. She's a Naismith Hall of Famer. She's won every award there is to, to win, including a National Player of the Year in college. She, I think she was a six-time WNBA All-Star. Um, she's one of the greatest basketball players ever and uh, and now one of the greatest college coaches ever. And so we're, we're just thrilled that we got her on the show. Yep. Really a special up. We've been trying to do this for a long time, uh, and it lived up to our expectations. Absolutely. Again, this is uh, part two of our coaching series brought to you by Future. Let's get to our awesome conversation with Don Staley. All right, let's welcome in Coach Don Staley. Coach, thank you so much uh, for joining us, for making the time. We were just discussing. We've tried to get you on the show for over a year. You were supposed to be part of our leadership series. We had some scheduling conflicts. And we're just so happy and thrilled that you're able to do this as part of our coaching series. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'm I'm, I'm thrilled to be on, and uh, I hear everybody has a lot of fun being on being on your podcast. So I'm looking forward to it. Your your former play, player Asia Wilson, she came on the show um, last September. Uh, we had a we had a great great time with her. And she of course shouted you out, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, we should mention at the beginning here. Uh, you just launched your own podcast. Um, tell me about sort of the motivation to do that and, and why at this stage in your career you're, you're willing to sort of uh, start, start up a podcast. Well, I, I need to know from y'all whether or not what I got myself into. That's, that's number one. Um, but, you know, I I'm really am not known to be a talker. Um, so it, it actually surprised me that I, I agreed to do it, but uh, I, I linked up with some good people um, at Just Women's Sports, i.e., you know, we're making the rounds. But I linked up with some great people who um, want to put women um, on a platform to utilize our voices. And I also have a insatiable desire to know what makes people successful. And I just try, I, I believe, um, hearing people's story people who aren't very successful or, or are on the path to be successful, they want to know that they're doing the right things or they just need to change something here or there. And maybe hearing from some successful people that they, they'll get that boost that they'll need to, you know, to check off being successful and then hopefully pay it forward. The show is called net life with Don Staley. Lisa Leslie is my, my first guest. That's amazing. So Don, I I know you. You said you. You're not much of a talker, but you've as lo- like as long as you know. I've sort of 
followed you, you have always been a great interview. Like you just, you just say really interesting, thoughtful things, things that, when did that, were you, do you feel like you were like that as a player or do you feel like you've become a better communicator over time? Well, I'm the youngest of five. So, you know, in my household, I didn't get a chance to talk. Me and my, my, my brother that's closer in age, we didn't really get a chance to talk in the house and we still don't. We got a family thread and I'm luckily to get a text in here and there, but it is actually overpowered by my older, older siblings. Um, you know, I, I mean, when you, you, when you're an athlete, when you're a coach, obviously the, the microphone is stuck in your face a whole lot. Um, I just found that I, I, I don't search for answers. I just give them what's on my heart. And a lot of times, a lot of times people like that because it's not the old, you know, you know, people are, are media savvy and they give you what they, you know, what you want to hear. And I'm going to give you just kind of what's on my heart. And fortunately, people, they dig it. They dig just me being me. Is is that is that notion that I, the idea of just giving what's on your heart, being a true, your true authentic self, um, is that a reflection of who you are as a coach as well, as a communicator? You know, as, I mean, this is my 22nd year coaching and I, I can honestly say that the players, my, my, some, most of my former players, my current players, they, they actually, allow me to be me because some players don't allow you to be you like you gotta you gotta watch out because you know the confidence thing is you know it's hard to maintain um but we've been fortunate here I've been fortunate throughout my career to have players that we have like a real relationship like I can talk to them like I can you know they can talk to me like it doesn't it's not like a one-way thing it's like this is what I see you know, what I'm telling you on the court isn't a reflection of whether or not I like you personally, because I do like all. Of, I mean, if I didn't like you, I, I wouldn't recruit you. If I didn't like you, I wouldn't. I want you. I wouldn't want you a part of, you know, my daily life. So we've created a we just forged a bond to where you, you don't they don't they don't overstep the bounds of making it personal. And I don't, you know, I don't really care. I don't, I mean, I, I just want production on the court, off the court. You know, we have fun. I'm a practical joker. I like to have fun and I do have a short memory. So I'm not thinking about basketball if I'm interacting with you off the court. And I'm not saying it never happens, but the frequency of it happened, I, you know, I can deal with. So I can, I can coach a little bit longer if, if they're more infrequent in dealing with young people who really take it personally. Well, this, this brings up a topic that I want to get into a little bit later, and that's just how you build trust with your players. But before we get into your coaching stuff, I, I think it's really interesting for uh, people that didn't grow up when I grew up, that they know how good of a player you were. So I actually, you were one of the first basketball players that I ever heard of. So when you started at UVA, I was living in Charlottesville. We then moved to Roanoke, and my sister started playing uh, basketball uh, around 1992. And this is at the the peak of your UVA career. Debbie Ryan, who's a legend, was coaching UVA. Um, but you're from you're from North Philly. Like, how did you end up going to UVA? JJ, did you go to North Philly when you played with the Sixers? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't spend a ton of time there. I'm going to be honest with you. Don, I was also, you know, I was commuting. I was doing some commuting from Brooklyn to Philly. You know, I typically okay. hung out in Camden and South Philly, you know. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Well, UVA started recruiting me. It was two schools that recruited me since I was in the eighth grade, UVA and Penn State. So, I, and those were only the only two schools that I visited, like only took two official visits. Like I was, you know, it was really important to, to build a bond with my coach. And and I, I built a bond with uh, Debbie Ryan. And then I, you know, Rennie Portland was the head coach then, but I, I had a strong bond with the assistant coach, Dan Durkin. 
And the, the, those were the two schools. I visited Penn State first. And I've said this a few times, but when I went there, um, I, I didn't feel it. Like, I didn't feel it. Uh, and they and they actually lived in like those, like the old dorms where you got a room, you got a roommate, you got to take your bucket, you got your robe on, you got to go down the hall and you got to shower and you got to collect all your stuff and go, Ugh, I didn't. I didn't feel that. And then when I went to UVA on my official visit, it was plush. It was like I, w- I had a roommate and I had three other rooms in this suite. We had a common area. We had like two or three showers. We had two, three stalls. And and it was like an apartment. And if you grew up in the projects in North Philly, that was like, a, I mean, I had my own condo. Um, so the the dorms is what separated the two schools. Honestly, because I, you know, I, I, I really like both schools. And when you when you are a recruiter and when you've been recruited, you know that there are going to be some non-negotiables. That's how you're going to make come up with a decision. What are you what are that's why I tell recruits, what are your non-negotiables? Because if if you know them already and we don't we're and we can't we don't have it, then let us know. We let us move on. The non-negotiable for me was I the, the accommodation piece. Because, I, I mean, again, I grew up in the projects. There were seven of us in a three-bedroom house, one bathroom, you know, tight quarters. It was really important for me to have my space. So UVA was the place. JJ, what were your non-negotiables? <laughs> <laughs> I I didn't have any non negotiables. I, I think mean, that's such an interesting way to think. But you're like, it's like if, I, if 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 it doesn't work, just move on, just keep it moving. Right. <laughs> I think I just wanted to play and compete for championships. I Don, I I really wanted to go to. I've said this a million times. I really wanted to go to UVA. I was a Virginia kid. I played Boo Williams AAU. Grew up in Roanoke and Charlottesville. I had a deep desire to stay home, but. Duke was my dream school. It was <laughs> it was a tough decision. It was a tough decision. Um. I'm curious how your non-negotiable uh, sort of played itself out as a coach. Like, what's the current sort of dorm setup like at South Carolina right now for your for your players? Now, now, I mean, when I first got here, we we tried hard not to take parents and recruits to the dorm that our kids were in. Like, really hard. We actually they had to. Just say, hey, can we go check out the dorms? And then we're like, damn. Uh, but but now they they have uh, check out what they got. They they have, and we have mainly doubles. So it's just you and a roommate. You 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 both got your own room. You got a common area. You got a kitchen. You got you have washer and dryer. Like each apartment has a washer and dryer. Um, and then we have a quad where there's four of them. We got, you know, we had four freshmen and and it's worked out that the freshmen all like to live together or else we would have had them in doubles. So, I mean, it's it's nice. We we rush them over there. We rush them. Hey, let's go. And it's like I'm looking right at it. If I look outside of my office window, I can see where our players live. So it's it's pretty cool accommodations. The great coaches that I've had in my career um, and I'm just naming a few of them, but Doc Rivers, Stan Van Gundy, Brett Brown, Coach K. There was something that I took from them that helped me as a player. And and I'm not saying I will never coach. I probably won't coach. But if I ever were to coach, there were things that each of them did at a really high level that I would I would sort of use in my coaching philosophy. Was there anything that you took away from your time at UVA with Debbie Ryan that you use now as a coach? I, I, I do. And it is this. As I look back on my career, I, I think I was a pretty special player. Like I, I had a God-given talent. Um, and Debbie, Debbie met me where I was. Like, you know, I, I mean, I grew up again. The projects, I was just balling. I, they, things didn't make sense to me. Like fundamentals didn't really make sense. I had a, I had a talent. Like I, I had a flair. I could pass it. I could. I mean, I could. I mean, I could do some things with the basketball. But I didn't. You know, I didn't necessarily value the ball. And she wasn't a coach that said, "No, don't turn the ball over. 
you know, she was like, she made, she, she taught me, she taught me how to play through mistakes and, and I mean, I, I averaged five turnovers in my freshman year. Did you really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Five. Like, I mean, I, I made up for it because I could score, I could get steals and all of that. But what if she said, no, don't turn the ball, don't try stuff, don't. If she said that, I would probably be a different player. Now, I will have to say this. I got that from my first Olympic coach in Tara Vanderveer at Stanford. Like, she was strictly methodical. Value the ball, you know, play high percentage basketball. And, I mean, it was somewhat of a transition for me. Um, and she used to embarrass me. Like, she would say, like, I tried out for the 92 Olympic team and I got cut. And there are multiple teams that you can make. So I made the basically the B team. So we trained and and Tara used to come up to me and say, if, if the Olympic coach wanted a point guard, do you think I would recommend you? I'm like, yeah, like, why wouldn't you? She's like, no, you turn the ball over too much. And she and she hurt my feelings. Like she did. She really hurt my feelings when she said that. But she she gave it to me raw. And I like that. So she put it the onus back on me. And I learned. I just I started valuing the ball because that wasn't gonna be the thing. I wanted there were only two things I wanted to do when I was growing up. That was win a national championship and and you know, be an Olympian and win a gold medal. Those are because those are the two things that I saw in women play growing up in the project. So I wanted that. So I wasn't going to let me being, you know, having a turnover field career um, deter me from, you know, being an Olympian. So I I got better. I mean, I initially got better. I valued the ball a little bit more. So, I, I mean, each coach that I've had, it, it it, it probably well, I guess it I guess they are standards, um, and Debbie's standard I don't think was lowered because of me. It was sometimes you get those special players that you got to deal with a lot differently. Now you she couldn't say that to every she couldn't coach everybody like that, but she could pick and choose you know certain players that in the end I think she saw the big picture. In the end, once I got it, I'll be able to. Take care of these things my, myself. Once once she's taught me, I want to sort of emphasize something that you're 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 getting at here. Whether it's as a coach, uh, whether it's as a uh, f- talent evaluator in the front office of a WNBA team or an NBA team, whether it's as a manager in a business, I think it's so important uh, to to see the big picture, to recognize that some individuals have greatness. And we can sit here and nitpick any single player. We can nitpick the best women's players. We can nitpick the best men's players. We can do that all day. You have to be able to see the greatness and recognize that the greatness outweighs the bad. You have to take some of the bad with the good. I, the, the guy I always think about with this is Russell Westbrook. Like I, when I think about him, like everybody's complaining about the you know him on the Lakers. The Lakers traded for who the guy they got. The guy, the guy they got is Russell Westbrook. And you have to be willing to live with some turnovers. You have to know he's a 30% shooter from the three-point line. But you know what? He does a lot of other things really great. And you have to be able to live with that. And I think that's that can be hard as a coach. It certainly can be hard as a talent evaluator. But that's a really important piece of coaching, I think. It It, it is. and and he, But it, it's also a fine line as well because you got – you got other players saying, hey, this guy turned his ball over. I can take care of it. I can. Yeah, but you can't get the steals. You, you're you not that explosive with the basketball. You know, you you aren't productive. Like, and it's and it's hard. That's why the communication piece is so very important in the beginning, during and it's continued talk because, I, you know, we got a we got a right now in South Carolina, we got a team full of. We probably got out of our 16 players, 11 or 12 of them are like McDonald's All-Americans, right? And if you look at our stats, only five of them play, like really a lot of minutes. So there's like six, seven McDonald's All-Americans sitting on the bench, like playing like 
zero to 10 minutes a game, if that. And uh, it is, you know, but they, we have to teach them. This isn't going to be your career. You just have to learn while sitting and it doesn't feel good. But for right now, with the schedule that we put together, it's hard. So you're going to have to learn a different way. And I'll I tell you this. We had that. We have to have conversations with their parents because we and we do. We Zoom with their parents once a month. And I'm like, look, right before the season, like in November, beginning of November, I said, your daughters are about to experience something that they've never experienced. You're going to experience things that you you know, you have an experience with your daughter. They're going to sit a whole lot like they're not going to play some or they're going to play very little, or they may play a lot, but it's all new for, for everybody. And it's going to be traumatic to the family because you're used to them playing, but they'll get it sooner or later. They'll get it. And, and although it helps in the beginning, but now we're in the, you know, had midway point through our season is just like, yo, I've had calls with parents and I'm, I'm okay with talking, talking things through it. It, it, it's really not going to change anything unless your daughter becomes more productive, but they need to feel good about it. And I don't, or they need to feel better about it. Never, they're never going to feel good about it. Talking and communicating is, is key. And I, I try to be upfront with that because it just is, it, it, it problem solves a lot sooner than letting it, letting it build up. So I think this has been written about in uh, you know a bunch of different sports, not just basketball. But do you guys feel like there is a challenge sometimes? The more talented you are as a player in terms of the transition into coaching, because you're so used to being able to do everything you want yourself, and and being able to sort of teach those lessons to a younger generation who just may not have the same you know skills that you did. Um. I mean, for, for me, as a, you know, I, I was a point guard, so I I played a different role than I had the ball in my hand, but I was a distribu- distributor. I was a phil- facilitator. I was one that kind of brought the team together. Like, you know, I mean, even if I had to fake them out, like, you now I played with, I played with Cheryl Swoops and Lisa Leslie. They both want the ball. So, you know, I would tell Cheryl, hey, Cheryl, I got you next time. I missed you. But, you know, it'll keep her engaged. Um, so, I mean, I was real fortunate that, I mean, I'm I'm just doing point guard things as a coach. It's just, it's, it's really natural for me to be a coach. And I don't, I don't even know why I didn't jump right into coaching, but it wasn't something that I wanted to do. But now that I'm in it, it's what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and it, and it's, I find it easy. I mean, meaning it's easy to identify the problem and it's easy to communicate what the problem is to resolve it. It doesn't mean, you know, I mean, in a process, you also, you're going to hurt some, some young people who have some big dreams. And for, like right now, like they got, they all want to go to the WNBA. They all want to make money. They all want to, they all aren't going to do it, you know, but when you have to tell them, this is the role we need you to play this year. They all, they're they always thinking about the WNBA. Like, they could be freshmen. Like, it's three years away. Like, what are you thinking about? What are you thinking about? I mean, it's two years away. It's So, in, in one regard, in, in one regard, some of, they see the big picture when it's their want. Their want, what they want. In other regards, they're like, Today I'm not playing, so I can't get this. So I mean, it's it's cool. Like it's it, that's the challenge of it. like I'm drawing the challenges, and the challenge is to get that that young lady to think more more about the big picture when she's thinking about the daily uh, not playing, practice hard every day mentality. So it, it's a push and pull type of thing, and I I want all our players to really have a have an understanding of the process because they're going to have to, they're going to have to draw on this process somewhere else in their life. And it's probably not going to have to do anything to do with basketball. Tommy, to your question, and I've, I've said this on the podcast before, the best players aren't always the best leaders. 
and and so much of coaching is leading and so much of coaching is having a certain level of self-awareness and a certain level of emotional intelligence because ultimately at the end of the day what you're doing is you're you're managing talent and you're managing personalities and that's probably at least at at the NBA level and high level college basketball like like a duke or like a south carolina that's ultimately what you're doing that's probably i would guess on your biggest challenge and listening to you talk for the last 10 minutes or so about this topic that ultimately i think is your biggest challenge sure you want to you want to teach them basketball knowledge but so much of it is leading and managing personalities that that's that's all it is and keeping them in a place where they can continue to 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 move forward cuz they you know when they when they're in the rut when they don't feel like things are working out the way they visualize it it stunts them like it it could stunt your growth and you, you got to you, you gotta be around people who can identify that. Like you got to choose a coach that can cater to that because I would say that more than more than the good days because everybody's good on the good days. It is who you can trust, who you can talk to and communicate with on your worst day. Seriously, like I tell our I tell the people that I recruit all the time, like we're going to make you feel good during the recruiting process. You're going to come here. We're going to roll out the red carpet. We're going we're gonna to give you our best. Everybody's going to do that. I want you to think about, like, if it's two or three years down the line, when you're in a slump or when you lost a, you know, when you, if you lost a, knock on wood, a parent or you broke up with a boyfriend or whatever, like, who's going to get you back on course to be your talented self? And they don't, they don't, that's not a part of their equation because they're in the receiving the good stuff and you lose sight of, you lose sight of it. And it's, it's, it's human nature to do that. Like I try to create the worst case scenario. Like I do like the worst. What if you don't play? What if you don't start? But, but some coaches do the reverse. They're like, you're going to start for us. You know, you're going to, you're going to play 30 minutes. You can't tell a kid that and and still and still control your locker room. Like you're going to tell a freshman she's going to play 30. She's going to start. What about your, your seniors and your juniors and the people who have been here? Because you know what's going to come up. If that freshman doesn't start or plays 30 minutes, parents going to be on the phone. They're going to tell they're going to tell their teammates. This is what she told me. And it it ruins your, it ruins your locker room. I can't do. It. I have never told a player she's going to start. I was going to ask you about Temple. Like, did did your process change over time, or, or was this like this from the beginning, and it just has you know manifested itself in like a huge amount of success? What was changed? My 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 principles haven't changed. How I deal with young people changed. Like, you know, some stuff I you know some stuff I'm not going to fight. Like, I'm not like I I used to fight. Like I used to say, hey, let's sacrifice being on social media for the season. Then I'm like, Hell, social media is a big part of their lives. Like they don't know how to, they don't even know how to communicate without their phones. Like, so then I'm like, let's, let's be responsible. And I'm glad that the NIL stuff is here because now they're a brand. So they're going to watch what they post. They're going to do certain. So it's, we got some control over it because they're not going to do anything outlandish. And I, and I did this like a few years ago where let's get rid of social media. Let's just wait. Let's just, and then one of our, during this time, one of our players, we played Stanford. They were the number one team in the country and we had them. We had them. Uh, one of the players made a big mistake, missed the layup, missed two free throws, whatever. Somebody, <laughs> somebody blamed them for the loss. But she didn't have social media, so she couldn't. She couldn't. I know she wanted to. I know she wanted to. So it worked in our favor when it comes to that. But now, I mean, the, they're younger. Kids are younger, like mentality. They're so much younger than they were when I first got into coaching at 18 to 22 year, you know, two year olds. So I, I just, 
I just meet them where they are. Seriously, I meet, I meet them because it'll save you. It, it saves me some headache. Some stuff I just, I, I don't have the, I don't have the stamina. But the other stuff, the discipline, the approach, the work ethic, I got plenty of stamina for that. I don't have stamina to chase them on social media. I'm actually amazed at, I guess all college coaches to a degree have to deal with this in, in some sense, but the amount of stuff that you have to worry about as a college coach, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's amazing. And not to mention, by the way, and you've brought it up twice now, but the recruiting, the recruiting is is got to be. I'm not going to call it a nuisance. I don't want to put words in your mouth. But in talking to a bunch of, I, you know, I I come from the du- I come from the Duke family, so a bunch of you know my former teammates, former coaches, they all coach, and to them, that's one of the most challenging parts of the job because it's it it's inherently difficult, um, but it also can be a, a little a little bit of a nuisance, I guess. Oh, I mean, it, it's a big nuisance, especially you know when you're when you're principled, like when you're, I mean, like you're, you're either like us or you don't like seriously, like, but you got to play the game. You got to, you know, and I'm not very good at it. Seriously. I'm not very good. I at it. I think you're all right. If you have 11 or 12 McDonald's all Americans, No, we got, we got a good, we got a good I was staff. Gonna say, no, I think you're okay. I think you're doing okay. at The recruiting. <laughs> we got a great staff. <laughs> Like really, they just set it up real nice. Like I'm not the, I'm not the, I'm not the like everyday BS. Like I'm not, I can't, I can't hold conversations like that. Like I'm, a, I could, I get you once a week, and and we can fill up some stuff to talk about within the week. But every day, like we we we're not a staff that does it every day. Like we hit all the right people. Like I'm more of let me talk to your mom, let me talk to your dad, let me talk to your best friend, let me. Let, let me make it a, a we thing, a family thing. And and it is and it's like I get those people talking about South Carolina to them. And it doesn't have to be me all the time. So we we just we really are we, we bring in the family. We make them feel good about it. And and it's different now though, because I, I do think I do think young people are more susceptible to come to South Carolina now versus, you know, six, seven years ago when like I'm known as like an old school, like disciplinarian, like in the field. I, that's what I'm known as. I'm and, and probably am known as hard to play for. Um, Cause I, I got rules. We got rules here. Like you, you're not going to be out there looking like that or doing whatever you want to do. And if if you were brought up in the you know right way and have disciplined parents, that your lifestyle is not going to change. It's not. It's not going to change. But if you know if you don't respect your parents or your friends and all of that, you have a hard time here. No, Don. Don I had one one other question about your playing career. Um, so you know, two-time national player of the year, you win an Olympic gold medal in 1996. The WNBA launched, I think the following year, I want to say in 97 was their mm-hmm. inaugural, inaugural year. Um, and you were playing in the, you played in the ABL, I think from 96 to 98. So why didn't you, uh, why weren't you in the inaugural season of the WNBA? And and also is sort of like just a, 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 a follow up to that. Those early years of the WNBA, what were they like? Um, I, I didn't play in the in our role, uh, WNBA, um, uh, because I made a commitment to the ABL during, like we, we trained for one year prior to the 96 Olympic games. So from 90, like September of 95, all the way up to, um, June, July of the Olympics. So we trained during that time and, we didn't know there was going to be a WNBA. We didn't even know there was going to be an ABL until probably uh, shortly, short, uh, probably January of of ninety six. Um, and I I made a commitment to the ABL that I'm all in. And then a few months later, um, 
we, we were in a like a team meeting and you know it was told to us that the WNBA was going to start and they put it out there <laughs> and and you know it was cool like it was cool i knew i wasn't jumping ship um uh, because it was it was $150,000 they they guaranteed us <laughs> and then the WNBA you know the salaries weren't as much as is that but i didn't do it for the it wasn't for the money it was more from um, me being loyal and saying this is what I made a commitment to. And I don't knock Lisa, Leslie, Cheryl Swoops or Rebecca Lobo. Those were the top names in our, our game at that point. So it was really important that the WNBA got them um, and just kind of promoted around them. Um, and it, it's, it worked out. I got two years playing in the ABL and then I actually decided that um, it was too much for my knees because I had bad knees. The ABL played during the traditional months of a uh, of basketball season, and it was over a long period of time. And then the WNBA was in the summer, so I jumped ship. And actually, the ABL went down sh- shortly thereafter. So it was like, I mean, I didn't want it to, but I, I got out in time to still save Christmas for my family, unlike some of my other <laughs> friends. <laughs> So I don't know the backstory on this, and I, I I tried to find it and I couldn't. But the backstory of you being an active WNBA player, and as you mentioned, WNBA season is is during the summer, um, while simultaneously coaching Temple. I, I think you started in two thousand at Temple. Um, how did that sort of deal sort of come about with with coaching Temple and playing at the same time? Well, I mean, Temple, Temple's AD saw something in me that I didn't see in my, in myself. And, you know, third at 30, I'm like in my prime, like I'm feeling the best that I've felt. And he, I mean, a, a mutual friend of ours uh, worked in the athletic department at Temple and they fired their coach. And he asked me if I had any interest in the coaching job. I was like, no, like, no. And then he kept asking and I'm like, no, like I'm playing. I'm <laughs> uh, and then the, the final four was in Philly and I was training with the national team, USA national team. We were coming to Philly to play during the final four an exhibition game with China. So the AD's like, come on over and just, you know, come on over and meet me while you're in town. So I'm like, cool. So I'm like, okay. I mean, I, I went over there. I mean, I had like jeans on and a T-shirt, right? And I sat down in his office and he's like, well, can you lead? I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> now, that, mind you, I ain't never been on no interview before a day of my life. Like, I played basketball. My interview was trying out for teams and stuff. Um, so I'm like, can I lead? I'm like, I say, well, I mean, I've been captains of my team. I mean, I'm a point guard. I mean, that's position. And then he was like, you know, basically, can you turn our program around, like the women's basketball program? Around? And I was like, whoa, is that a challenge? Like, and I never looked at it as a challenge. And the moment that I looked at it as a challenge, I was intrigued. Seriously, like ain't no coaching experience, nothing, nothing. And then, you know, the conversation continued. And it was light. And then he was like, you know, can you mind going down here meeting some other people? And I was like, sure, I'm here. Like, where's Coach Cheney, basically? I want to where's Coach Cheney? Um, so he takes me down the hall into this conference room, and it's like 10 to 12 people sitting around this conference table, and they sit me at the head, and they're just, like, firing all these questions. You know, it was like, like the committee that was going to pick the next coach. Like, I had, I had no idea. Like, I'm on an interview. Like seriously, a, an interview, and again, you, you you throw that those questions at me. I'm gonna give you what's on my heart, and they were like, "Well, what do you see yourself doing in five years?" I said, "I see myself playing in the WNBA." Like seriously, like I mean, they were like, "Do you you know do you see yourself like having a career like Coach Cheney?" I was like, "No, I I don't I don't I don't I don't even, I don't want to coach. It's not what." Two weeks later, I took the job, y'all. Like, seriously, it, it went like that. 
the motivation then was the challenge. Yeah, the the yeah, the challenge was turning the program around. Yeah, I, I, I want to actually because you 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 just had a great profile in the Wall, Wall Street Journal a few weeks ago. <laughs> And there's this like quote in there, and it's mid sentence, and I have no idea why the writer of the story, and it was Jason Gay who does a great job, but it says I never wanted to be a coach. And then there's nothing after that, and so I'm reading the article, and I'm like, well, give me some context here. I never wanted to be a coach as a player. You never thought about it. You never thought about what was next. Certainly at at thirty, you weren't thinking at all. You just knew you wanted to hoop. It was the next day of hooping. You know what? I've the I, I, you, you're gonna find it strange. The only two goals that I had in life: Olympics, gold medal, and national championship. Like I didn't get one in college, so I thought that was you know long gone. I never set goals. Like I never like I. I don't set goals. Like honestly, I do believe my career and my life has divine intervention. Like I'll get what I'm supposed to get when I'm supposed to get it. Like seriously, I and I it's the most uncanny thing. And I'm I'm in the profession of like 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 helping young people like set goals in life and and I've never like, you know, yeah, you have your that like I got into coaching um because of the challenge of it. And then once I was in it, like once I was in it, it became more of like being a dream merchant for young people. Like seriously, like I got, you know, I got everything I could, like I got more than I could imagine from basketball playing more. I want that for other young people. Like I want them to find their niche in life. If it's basketball, cool. If it's something else, Let's let's figure out how we get you to the people that are the experts in this and let's do it. But I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. And I don't really see myself as a coach either. I know they call me coach and all that, but it's it's just life. It's like it's 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 helping young people navigate through through life, playing a game. Don, I have two follow ups to this temple temple story. The first one is after you were there for a little while, did you ever hear, like, if there was any internal conflict there about offering you the job while you were still playing or if everybody was on board with it? And then the second question, which JJ and I I know are both wondering, is how the F did you build that thing while also <laughs> playing at the same yeah. time? It's like S- six tournament appearances in eight years for a program that was going nowhere. It's yeah, not a it's- part-time job. Like, it's not one of those <laughs> things you can just do on the side. <laughs> Um, no, they didn't. I think they wanted me like I'm from North Philly. I grew up, I grew up going to Temple games. Um, I played on their campus like every summer growing up. So I think they had an inkling of who I was and what I represented. Um, and I think they were just throwing shit on the wall. I do. I do. I think they were just, you know, throwing that ball from the other end of the court and they like, so, Hey, Sometimes long balls go in and, and it was a long one for me, but no, I think they were going to take me if I told them I'm just going to show up for games. Seriously. I think they would have taken me. Um, and, and what was that second question? How, how you built uh, temple to I that mean, success while also playing <laughs> While being an all star, you're very like, humble. You, you're very you're humble, an but still. <laughs> and then also, yeah. by the way, on the side, on the side, I'm leading teams to the NCAA tournament. <laughs> you know, it's all staff. It's all people. Now, I, I will say this: like I did, I when I first got the job, I hired some people to help me, like help me understand what I got myself into, because I didn't know, like. You know, I didn't know like all the administrative work and, you know, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can go through a practice. And, uh, kids would know what I'm talking about from a basketball perspective. I got that part of it. It's the administrative stuff that you, you know, that, you, that I didn't know anything about. So I hired, you know, some people that had just experience in it. And one of them basically thought I was like a figurehead, like, 
just like, no, like this is what I committed to. This is what this is. I want to learn, like teach me what I need to know so I can be a good coach. Uh, I got the basketball part. I do. I got that part. Um, although I thought I had it because, you know, when, when I first started coaching, I'm like, you know, there's a timeout, it's a media timeout. Like it's, it's a long time. Like I would say my piece, like I'm in a huddle. All right, break. Let's go. We good. And then it's like, we got two minutes left. I'm just like, I'm, I'm, I'm done y'all. I'm, I'm done. Get up. Let's. So, so obviously I don't have that issue anymore. Um, but it's staff. It's like you surround yourself with people. And I, I have actually, I, I spent two years at Temple without um, someone that's been with me for the last 20 years, Lisa Boyer, who actually was my ABL coach. Like she was my ABL coach. She played me like 40 minutes, 40 minutes a game, took, took years off my career because she played me that many minutes. She just actually walked in. Um, but I once I had a lot of staff turnover in the first two years, um, she was coaching in the WNBA by this time. And I'm just like, I need help. Like, come, come help coach me. And I had to do the recruiting thing. Like I would, she's a good friend of mine. So she used to call me and I wouldn't even say hello. I used to say, you coming, you coming to Temple? Come on. Like, and then she didn't, she didn't want to come back <laughs> because of the recruiting. Like she's in the WNBA. She's like, I don't want to recruit. So I said, oh, you don't have to recruit. We got it. <laughs> so finally she came and she basically just helped take care of all that other stuff. Like I trust her. Like she sacrificed her career to help me. And she, you know, she's been by my side, you know, for the last 20 years. So you, you got to have people in your corner that complement and supplement the things that you don't do well. And we, I've been fortunate that I had people around me that just like my, my first recruiting class, they both work here at, at, at South Carolina. One is our director of basketball operations. And the other one is, 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 is my assistant. So it is those relationships that you build. Like my former players are like my best friends now. So it's, it's that kind of, you know, you, you, you make people feel good and they make, you know, they make you feel better. Like I've had that like my entire career. Like I've had the ability to make someone feel really good. And then in turn, they just like, they treat me, they treat me like royalty. I, I think I know the answer to this question, but I have to ask the question. The appeal of taking the South Carolina job. You, you've spent eight years at Temple. You've built that program into a respectable program. South Carolina now is a, is a powerhouse. But in, at the time in 2008, that was not the case. They were one of the worst teams in the SEC for years. So, so was it just about the challenge again? Or was there something else that, that led you to South Carolina? Um, one, it was a challenge. But, it, but, but, but also, like, I had been coaching for, for eight years. At a at a mid major level, and we kept going to the NCAA tournament and losing in the first or second round. And again, once I'm in, I was searching to win that national championship, that elusive national championship. So I'm just like, hell, I've, I've built up, you know, some some I, I, I've thickened my coaching skin. So I want to. I'm a competitor. So I said, I want to. I want to coach against the best. I want to be challenged. I want to. I want to see what the big time basketball is all about. And thinking my <laughs> thinking coming to South Carolina was my way in to the SEC because you know back then it was Pat Summit, it was Andy Landers, it was Mel Melanie Balcom, it was all these great coaches that have won, that have been to the Final Four. So I was like, I just. I just want to try my luck, try my skills, sharpening my tools against some of the best. And the first two years, seriously, I thought it was professional suicide. Like seriously, like like we 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 put a great staff together. And you know, that first year, I used to sit on the bench, right, and I would try to look down the bench. And as I looked down the bench, one of our assistant coaches used to. She used to block it. She was like, don't look down there. There's nothing down there. There's nothing down there. <laughs> but slowly, 
slowly, slowly, slowly, slowly, we became, you know, the we became the the unpopular right decisions for, for decision for people. And now we are the popular right decision for people. And it's it's just it's just finding the right people. I, I just found in the beginning, um, you're going to be who the majority of your team is. And the majority of our team were, were was made up of people who they just, they were here on the basketball scholarship, but they wanted to do other stuff. Like they didn't want to be pros. They didn't, they just wanted to be, you know, going to other professions. And I, it was hard. It was hard because we weren't cut from the same cloth. I, everything that I did was motivated by basketball and wanted to be great at basketball. And they made me slow down and say, hey, give me what I want. I'll give you what you want. So I had to, I had to sit down and just kind of say, well, what, like, what do you want? Like that, that those goals, you know, those goals, I those goals, I had to sit down with them. And finally, I figured out that they don't want basketball. So, okay, you don't want basketball. So here, this is what you got. Let me appease you for your, your major and all of that. But just give me two hours and let, let's get through this. And by the time that they were done with their careers, they wanted to be pros then. Like seriously, when they saw the program turning and moving in the right de- direction, they wanted to put off what they wanted to do, you know, in other professions and they wanted to play. So it's it's kind of cool to see that that evolution. I've I've sort of an existential question for you because this is something that I've thought about a lot. Um, you, you know, similar to you, I, I never really had any goals outside of winning as a player. When I went to Duke, I wanted to win a national championship. Actually, I wanted to win like three national championships, which I didn't win one. And when I got to the NBA, I wanted to win an NBA championship. That's that's literally all I thought about when I was training practicing pregame like it all was building up to that moment of winning a championship and you obviously accomplished one of your goals as a player in winning a gold medal you didn't do it as a player you did it as a coach in 2017 when when South Carolina won a national championship that moment was it was it everything you hoped it to you hoped it would be in terms of its significance and meaning to your life and your basketball journey, even though you didn't accomplish it as a player? It it actually was, it, it was on a deeper level, like, like more gratifying. Like seriously, like, because, because so many more people were involved in it. Like, and I got to take you back to like, my Virginia days, my Temple days as a coach, and all of my former players up until 2017. Like, we all believed we were going to win a national championship. We all got together. We, I mean, basketball brought us together because we wanted to win a national championship, and it didn't take place. So once we won, once we won, I I actually got – all of my teammates at Virginia, all of my former players and coaches at Temple, all of my former players at um, South Carolina and coaches, I got the miniature national championship trophies because they, they're the ones that believed in it far before it actually happened. And I, I, I hold them in high regards because – we were in the trenches together and we pulled every single person, every single one of them to our 2017 championship. And because of that, like the moment, and I didn't tell them that I got them. I just got their addresses and I sent it to them. And once they got it in the mail and I, I put a placard on the back of it and it said, because of you. And it was that quite simple. It was because of them that we were able to do this. And I know a lot of people say, well, the current, no, nah, it was, it was a buildup. It was a buildup. It was that desire for all of those years. I think it was like 27 years, 27, like to get it. So again, I, I, my, my path is divinely ordered. Like 
who would have thought that after college I was like, I'm, I can't even get the national championship, but I'm, I'm going to get this gold medal. I'm going to get another one. I'm going to get another one. I got gold medals. But that was the vacant thing that I always wanted to do. So look at God bringing me back into coaching in 2000. It's cool. It's cool. What an incredible journey. Um, of all the things you've done as a player, um, and in the intro, we'll have gone through your whole resume, which is quite impressive, including the the, the Basketball Hall of Fame. But in, in everything you've done, are you able to say this one thing is your greatest accomplishment? Um, the greatest. Uh, I mean, this this is something that I wanted. I, I, I it wasn't a goal because I didn't know about it when I was younger. I, I wanted to be a Hall of Famer. I wanted to be a Hall of Famer, and to be a Hall of Famer means that means that you've done some great stuff, and. That's what I wanted. And I want something. I want to be a Hall of Famer coach as well. Like, I, since I'm here, you know, you might as well shoot for the stars. Like, like I want that because cause you're, you're, you're with royalty of the whole game of basketball, the whole game. And to be with the greats is a tremendous accomplishment. That's my selfish though. Uh, no, no, but uh, that's, I mean, that's why I asked the question. Cause I, it, I think it's, you, you kind of said it, but to, to be in the hall of fame as a player, that means any other goal <laughs> you probably did. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know right, what I mean? right. And it's the same right. thing with coaching to be in the hall of fame as a coach. Damn. You must've won a lot of fucking games, <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, um, I, I want to go back to one. I have sort of one last question uh, and, and You've kind of you've kind of built up to this question, but I wanted to to ask it because I'd I'd sort of alluded to it uh, earlier, and it it is it is I think one of the greatest challenges um, in general, but certainly in 2022, it, it's a it's a huge challenge, and that's just building trust because trust is is not inherent. Uh, trust as a teammate was never inherent for me. Uh, trust in a coach in, in some figurehead was never inherent. Like trust has to be earned. It takes time. And so the philosophy about building trust and, and you've touched a bit on, on just living your life with principle, but in, in terms of real life action, like what does that look like? How do you go about building trust with your players? Um, I mean, when, when you're building trust, especially with young people nowadays, you, you have to do the, the work up front because again, they, they, they have their trust systems in place. They do. I mean, by the time they get to us, they're already in place. Um, and during the recruiting process, you, you build some of it, some of it. And then once they get to you, um, you're still building, like you're still in that, that space Cause you're going to hurt them. Like you're going to hurt them throughout. You're going to hurt them. But if you hurt them and you force them to deal with that hurt by themselves, it, there's separation created. But if you hurt them and you walk with them and you communicate with them, they know that you're someone that, that cares about them. And then let me just tell you that I'm going to go take it a step further. There comes a time when you don't walk with them and you give them that space to grow and to learn. Here you, give me, I'm going to give you an example. One of our kids has a shooting slump like every year, like every single year. And our first year, we walk through it, we, you know, I believe in you. Let's go. Let's continue to do you. Second year, same thing. Hey, fight through it. It's mental. It's mental. Just keep taking good shots, <laughs> right? And then went through it this year. I didn't say a word to her. Not one word. Because she's getting to the point where she's going to be in the WNBA. I, I'm not going to be there. You had to figure out how you get out of it. Like, I'm going to still coach you up. I'm still going to believe in you. I'm still going to say, hey, you know, I'm probably going to do something different in that, hey, I'm going to 
I'm, I'm, we're going we're gonna to script this. First two plays of the game, they're yours. Do what you need to do with them. Like, I'll do stuff like that versus hold her, hold her hand. Because she's getting to a point where she's going to leave us. And you got to be able to stand on your on your own because you're not, you know, that is only 144 players in the WNBA. Everybody's waiting for you to have that, that slump. And then if you don't know how to deal, you if you don't have mechanisms to navigate through that, you're going to sink or, or, or you're going to, you got to sink or swim. And she probably think I'm mad at her, but I'm not like, I'm not mad. Like we're still winning. I'm still running sets for her. Like I'm just, I just tell her when you're going through a slump, don't get mad when you miss good shots. Get mad when you, when you, when you, when you miss bad shots. Cause you could correct, you could correct that. If you just take good shots, they're going to go in eventually. Just don't press and start shooting bad shots. And then, you know, she, I mean, she's been she's been doing extremely well since she's been out of it. But, you know, sooner or later, I'm just going to I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell her what I did because I don't think she really knows. She probably thinks I don't you know, I don't believe in her. I don't you know, it, it, I let them have that space in their head. And then I'm going to say, boom, this is what I did. This is what I did. When this podcast comes out, you should just send her the link. And say <laughs> you can listen this. to the whole thing or okay. jump to minute fifty six. <laughs> Let me show you how I I mental ninja'd you. You know, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, no, but I, I look. I I love that. I because I think you are in a position, and and as as college coaches are, but you're you're in a position where you're sort of bridging the gap between young adulthood and actual adulthood. And and having the wherewithal and, and the sort of mental, you know, uh, the mental toughness to to know when to step in, when not to, because as you said, when once they leave the program, um, they got to be able to stand on their own two feet. They got to be able to problem solve on their own. Mm -hmm. And and that's a really, I think that's a really healthy way to look at things. Uh, Coach, this has been uh, an awesome hour of conversation. We uh, we've loved having you on the show. Thank you so much for the time. Appreciate it.